let's start the class lecture. I have a question before. Uh, so uh, do we all have to ask like uh, one question to the presenter like in one class period or do we just write it? Oh, uh, no. Okay, so motility is the movement of food through the GI tract by means of ingestion. Ingestion means taking food into your mouth. Like you're putting a piece of bread in your mouth. Then you chew it, that is chewing uh, food and mixing it with saliva. You know saliva contains two kinds of enzymes. Salivary amylase, saliva contains salivary amylase and uh, lysozymes. Salivary amylase partially break down your starch, carb. And lysozymes kills any microorganism you have eaten in the food. That's why when you eat, take time and chew it for a long time, mix with saliva so that you are digesting it and killing any microorganism you are eating through the food. Okay. After you <clears throat> have masticated the food, then you swallow it. And that process is called deglutition. See, deglutition is initially it is voluntary process. When you are in mouth, uh, in your upper part of esophagus and pharynx, it is voluntary. But when it goes down, it is involuntary. Once it passes into the esophagus, then there is contraction and relaxation of the tubular wall of the GI tract from your esophagus up to down to the large intestine. And that is called peristalsis. So peristalsis is a rhythmic wave-like contraction that move food through the GI tract. So this is moving the food from your esophagus down below. And then in the particularly in the small intestine, there is another contraction that is rhythmic local constriction of the intestine that makes food in the GI tract. So peristalsis is like squeezing down. Segmentation is like in two location, they are contracting. So when you, let's see if this is a GI tract here, if, if my hand is GI tract, okay? So this is this GI tract here. And if I mixing, contracting two point, what happens? The content of the middle part is mixing. So it helps in mixing. So let's see if somebody is, if, if, if you hang yourself upside down, this is your head and body. If you go upside down, hanging upside down and you put food in your mouth, still you can swallow and your food will go up through the esophagus to the anus against the gravity, that powerful peristalsis is in the GI tract. Once somebody is dead, this peristalsis is gone. And that's why length of GI tract is longer in the dead body compared to a live person. Another function is secretion. So our GI tract wall epithelial walls in the lumen of the GI tract can secrete several stuff. They can secrete enzymes like uh, <clears throat> in your stomach, you are secreting hydrochloric acid, uh, you are secreting mucus, you are secreting other hormones. So secreting is the cells putting things inside the lumen, that is secretion, okay? So that includes the release of exocrine and endocrine products into GI tract. Exocrine means glands which have ducts and they are secreting inside the GI tract. For example, your salivary glands are, we have salivary glands which are secreting saliva and putting into your mouth. That is exocrine because they have 
duct. Similarly, in the wall of GI tract, there are several endocrine cells. For example, we have castin producing cells. We have uh, histamine producing cells. We have adenosine producing cells. And those histamines are not liquid which get into your GI tract. They are secreted by those cells and get into your blood. That's why we call them endocrine because they have no ducts and that's why they are produced and delivered into your blood. So exocrine secretion include hydrochloric acid, water, bicarbonate, bile from your liver, lipase from your pancreas, some amount from your tongue, pepsin from your stomach, amylase from your salivary glands and pancreas, trypsin elastase, chymotrypsin from your pancreas, histamine uh, is from the local cells. And then here, endocrine includes hormones secreted into his stomach and a small intestine to help. Histamine is also not like in your GI tract. They are produced and they are like called paracrine secretion. They act on the local secretion, local cells, okay? Endocrine includes hormones secreted into the stomach and a small intestine to help regulate GI system. So hormones get into your blood and then act on the cells, other cells of the GI tract to produce their effect. And they are gastrin, secretin, CCKs, cholecystokinin, GIP, uh, glucagon-like peptide, guanine, VIP, vasopressin, dosin A and somatostatin. So these are all hormones you will see later, it will come, okay? Next function is digestion. Digestion, earlier every part is digestion, like you are chewing, swallowing, those all are the part of digestion. So what they do in digestion, they break down food molecule into a smaller subunit by mechanical way or chemical way. Mechanical is with force, mechanical force, and chemical is with enzymes. And then, the smallest particles of the digestion is passage of digested end product into blood or lymph, which is called absorption. So when you eat a piece of bread, it contains carb, protein, fat, okay? So carb is absorbed into your blood capillaries, glucose, fructose, and galactose. Amino acid is also absorbed into your blood capillaries. That means from your lumen, the space of your GI tract, it moves to the cell, pass from the cell into the interstitial space, and then into your blood. Whereas fat, once digested, they are not absorbed into capillaries. They are absorbed into enters into lymph capillaries. And then they do not go to heart. They directly from there go to your, sorry, they do not go to liver first. They go to heart. So amino acid and glucose absorbed, get into blood, from the blood it goes to liver, and then it goes to heart. But fat goes to heart directly. That's why you don't need a lot of fat because if there is any toxin, anything in the fat, liver is first time not doing anything, okay? So that is the absorption. Storage includes temporary storage and subsequent elimination of indig indigestible components of food. And then immune barrier includes physical barrier formed by tight junction between cells of the small intestine. So in the, GI tract wall, there is mucus, and under the mucus, there is submucus. And inside the mucus, some, under the mucus membrane, there are lymph nodes. Those lymph nodes, immune cells, fight infection, fight microorganisms. At the same time, each cell in the GI tract wall, they are like, let's see, this, these are the two cells. They are attached to each other by tight junction. So anything toxic substance in your GI tract easily cannot enter the cell, okay? They cannot enter 
inside the cell in your body. That's how they are playing the role in immune barrier. Okay, now the structure of the digestive system. So digestive system is composed of GI tract elementary canal. And what are the organs in the elementary canal? Starting from mouth, mouth, then pharynx, pharynx then esophagus, then um, stomach, then small intestine, small intestine, then large intestine, large intestine, yes, uh, and then anus, so, and yeah. That is the elementary canal organs. And accessory organs are all the organs which help them. So salivary glands. Around the ear in your cheek, there is gland, exocrine gland. That is called parotid gland. Under your mandible, there is another gland that is called submandibular. Under your tongue, that is called sublingual. Lingua is for tongue. And that is accessory organ, one of them. Then you have pancreas, liver, gallbladder. Those are the accessory digestive organs. <clears throat> GI tract from your mouth to the anus is 30 feet long and in dead or cadaver, this is like 32 feet long. It is longer because there is no contraction on the wall, so it relax and get longer. So this is the organ here. You can see in this diagram, uh, when you put food here in your mouth, first you bite with your teeth, grind it, and Mix with your saliva. Tongue is helping in manipulating and moving the food in your mouth. Tongue is just a group of skeletal muscles and that moves like your hand. It is hand inside your mouth, which is moving the food. And then it passes down here. Here is you call the uvula. You can see when you open your mouth, you see uvula. That uvula, when you swallow, it goes back and it does not allow food going back into your nose, it comes down. Then it reaches the pharynx. When it comes into the pharynx, then pharynx has two opening. Anteriorly, it is respiratory opening, which is larynx and posteriorly it is esophagus. <clears throat> Sorry. So when this pharynx becomes larynx and esophagus, there is another guard that is called someone? Epiglottis. 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 So epiglottis, when you are swallowing, they flap the wall here on the larynx and close the larynx. So food is not getting into your air and it's getting behind the larynx in your esophagus. Sometimes when talk and eat and larynx get confused, some of the food get into your, sorry, epiglottis get confused and some food particle get into your larynx that immediately creates the reflex, coughing reflex to take the food out of the larynx, respiratory passage. So esophagus now passes down, then it passes through the diaphragm. It is at the level of T10, thoracic vertebra 10. And then esophagus one enter the diaphragm, you see the tube enlarge. And that enlarged balloon of tube is called a stomach. This is slightly in the left side of your body, abdominal cavity. And then tubin, tube again becomes a smaller and coiled. That is intestine, a small intestine. And then again, slightly dilates becomes bigger, larger, so we call them large intestine. And then you have a rectum and anal canal. The large intestine is also called colon, okay? So 
these are the organs. The small intestine has three parts. The first part is called duodenum, this part, and then this upper part is jejunum, and the terminal part is ileum here, which joins the large intestine here in the cecum. And then cecum is the first part of large intestine, then ascending colon because it ascends, transverse colon, descending colon, and then it twists like a later S. That's why it is sigma later. So we call it sigmoid colon. And then you have rectum and anal canal and anus. Rectum is the location where we store is feces, okay? In the head region, you see, each side you have three salivary glands, parotid gland, paro means, para means around, otic means ear. So it is around the ear, so we call them parotid. And it is above the masseter muscle. Then there is sublingual gland and submandibular gland. Okay, layers of the GI tract and its microscopic structure. So <clears throat> to understand the physiology and function of the GI tract, we have to understand the histology of the GI tract. So GI tracts have several tunics, layers. They have four tunics. From inside out, so this is the section of your GI tract, and this is section taken from your small intestine. This is like very similarly same plan from mouth to the anus. It has the same tube. When you see the embryogenesis of the GI tract, you will see they develop as a tube and they twist around and then develop all the organs. So they have same layers, four layers, with some modification in different region because different region has different environment and they have different function, okay? So let's see from the mouth. There are four tunics and we are talking about the inner tunics. Inner tunic, any tunics or layers which is outside. That means out of four types of basic tissue, what kind is that? Endothelial? Epithelium. Epithelium. So like tissue are epithelial, connective, muscle, nervous tissue. So any surface of the body is epithelium. So GI tract surface is also epithelium. So your mouth is stratified squamous epithelium. Or upper part of the esophagus is also stratified squamous epithelium. Why? Because when you put like nacho, like very hard food or very spicy food, and that can abrade, rug, rub your surface of the GI tract. So you want them very tough, strong layer to protect from the abrasion or laceration or tearing. That's why it should be several layers of cells which resist the friction, and that is stratified squamous epithelium. But when it goes down in the lower part of this esophagus, then you don't, already your food is pretty much mixed, mixed. So you don't need that protection. Then that's why lower part is slowly changing. By the time you reach stomach, you have not the stratified squamous epithelium. You have columnar epithelium because you need secretion, you need absorption, you need digestion. Same thing in the small and large intestine columnar epitheliums. When you go large intestine, same thing. When you go anus, again, in the anal region, you have again, when defecation, sometimes hard stool, that needs to be protected from the, the laceration or from the rubbing. And that's why anal region is also covered by a stratified squamous epithelium. Okay? So let's see Typically small intestine. If you see from outside here, number one here, A diagram, my outermost layer is called serosa. Serosa is connective tissue. And sometimes this area is lined by mesentery, peritoneum with fat. Under it, you have muscle layer. 
with smooth muscle layer that is called muscularis externa. And then under the smooth muscle layer, muscularis externa, you have muscular, uh, the, the submucosa. Okay. And under the submucosa, you have mucosa. Okay. So it is magnified here. Let's see from outside in. The outermost layer is serosa here. Then you have muscularis externa. Muscularis externa has two layers of smooth muscle. Outer muscle is longitudinal. Why we call it longitudinal? Because the muscle orientation is along the long axis of GI tract. Another muscle is circular muscle. So that circular muscle is along the circular lining. So if this muscle is longitudinal, the muscle which is encircling the wall of the GI tract, that is circular muscle. So there is inner circular. <clears throat> Sorry. And then inside the muscularis externa, you have submucosa. You see? In the submucosa, there is a lot of connective tissue which contract and relax during the contraction and relaxation of the GI tract wall, which contains a lot of connective tissue, some glands, and a lot of blood vessels. Then is innermost layer is the mucosa. So mucosa start from muscularis mucosa. You see a small line? That is another thin layer of a smooth muscle. From here, everything inside the lumen. It, mucosa layer. So mucosa layer has structure. It has muscularis mucosi. Then you have the lamina propria, which is the connective tissue under the epithelium. And then you have the epithelial lining, you see? This epithelial lining. This enfolding of the epithelium is called plural villi or singular villus. And if you magnify, zoom in here. If you zoom in here, let me show you. If you zoom in here on this cell, let's see if you zoom in here and take one cell. If you take one cell here, and you see the apical layer here, the plasma membrane of these cells will be enfolding. And this enfolding of the plasma membrane of this epithelial cell is called, anybody? Microvilli. Microvilli, very good, very good, microvilli. Okay, so that is difference between the villus and microvillus. Uh, as I said earlier, inside the GI tract, there is capillary, there is lymphatics, you see here? Lymphatic vessel, LO, that is called lacteals, they are lymphatic vessels. So when food is here in this tube, once they pass through this epithelium, they get into lacteal. So what get into the lacteals? Among glucose, amino acid, and fat, which one enters the lacteals, lymphatic vessels? Fat. Fat. All glucose and amino acid enters these capillaries. Then under the Epithelium, there is lymph nodes which function as immune barrier. In some mucosa, there is some glands which secrete mucus and covers the surface. Between the two layers of muscle, there is the uh, special group of autonomic neurons. We call them myenteric plexus. And between the some mucosa, and the muscularis externa, there is some mucosal plexus. So myenteric plexus control the, these muscularis externa, and that helps in peristalsis and segmentation of the 
GI tract wall. Whereas submucosal plexus are the plexus which control these glands in the submucosa, how much to secrete. And these myentric plexus and submucosal plexus are controlled by the vagus nerve of the autonomic nervous system. Okay. Okay, so that is the, so muscularis is responsible for segmental contraction and peristalsis movement through the GI tract, as you know, circular and outer longitudinal layer of a smooth muscle. Activity of these layers moves food through the GI tract, which pulverize and mix it. Myenteric plexus between these two layers is major nerve supply to GI tract and includes fibers and ganglia from both sympathetic and parasympathetic system. So parasympathetic, increase the contraction through the vagus nerve. And sympathetic, decrease the contraction and secretion. Serosa is outermost layer, serve to bind and protect. So serosa is like connective tissue, they protect them. Consists of areolar connective tissue covered with layers of simple squamous cells. Okay, so what is regulating the function of our GI tract? This is controlled by autonomic nervous system because it is not our own control. So they are autonomic nervous system is parasympathetic and sympathetic. Parasympathetic effect is arise from vagus and spinal nerves because parasympathetic is craniosacral, yes? And stimulate motility and secretion of the GI tract. Sympathetic activity reduce peristalsis and secretory activity, whereas parasympathetic increase them. GI tract contains intrinsic, apart from a vagus control and autonomic control. These enteric nervous systems also act by itself. Like when you eat food and there is a stress, they generate action potential and this enteric nervous system work independently. That's why they are like slightly separate from the autonomic nervous system. So GI tract contains an intrinsic system that control its movement, the enteric nervous system. GI motility is, motility is influenced by other hormonal and paracrine secretion signals. So paracrine secretion is like some chemical compound produced by tissue, one uh, in a tissue by certain cell, but it works on other cells that is called paracrine. Okay. And some other hormones also influence the GI tract. Okay. So let's talk about from mouth to stomach, the structure and secretion. So in the mouth, what is the digestion? In the mouth, the major process function of the mouth is mechanical digestion. Means your mouth, organs in the mouth, teeth, tongue, saliva, they just mix them and break down into smaller particles to increase the surface area of the food particle. So later enzymes can have contact with larger particles, more particles of the food. Mastication, that's why it called chewing, mix food with saliva, which contains salivary amylase. Your teeth cut food into small pieces and grind them, increase surface area. Your tongue manipulate and move food and push it down in the throat and saliva in the mouth, saliva partially digest and moisten the food so you can swallow. Deglutition, swallowing begins as voluntary activity at the beginning. So oral phase, like when it is in mouth, you have voluntary, like you can control whether you want to swallow or throw up and forms a bolus. So when your mouth is making, mixing everything, then it makes a 
lump of food that is called bolus. It has a special name. Same food, we call it bolus now because it is mixed with saliva and it is like a lump. Pharyngeal and esophageal fares are involuntary and cannot be stopped. So it is pharynx. The upper part of the pharynx is pretty much voluntary, but once it goes into the esophagus, you cannot bring it out. That is in, involuntary because there is several muscles, group of muscle working together. To swallow, larynx is raised. Larynx is raised so that epiglottis covers the entrance of the larynx and food passes towards the esophagus. And these all function is organized by a master organ in your head. That is, which organ? Medulla of Langata, okay? Esophagus connects to pharynx to his stomach and upper third part, you see, is mix voluntary involuntary muscle once it goes down then there is lower sphincter of the esophagus or upper sphincter of the stomach this is called gastroesophageal sphincter it prevents only acid from getting inside the esophagus. Food, it comes easily here down, okay? Sometimes your acid enters the esophagus and that causes burning sensation in your throat. That is heartburn because acid from your stomach is killing your cells, epithelium here, okay? Stomach is the most distensible part of the GI tract. So let's see, once food get inside your stomach, we call it chyme. So here, once from the lower esophageal sphincter, once get into your esophagus, food inside here, we call them chyme. Some people say chyme, some people chyme, okay? Uh, stomach is the dilated part of your esophagus, so it has this dome shape is structure called fundus. Then you have this area body. This is called pylorus. And this is area is called antrum cavity. Okay. The histology of GI tract, you know four layers. You will see the same layer in the stomach plus a special feature. So outermost layer of the stomach as usual is the serosha. Then you have muscularis externa. Muscularis externa has three layers here. In other part, there is only two layers, but here, outermost longitudinal, middle circular, and innermost oblique muscles. And then some mucosa is folded, mucosa is folded, and that makes a rugi. So that rugi are called stomach rugi or gastric rugi. So when your stomach is empty, these rugis are a lot, a lot folded. And when you have eaten, they stretch. That's why your stomach is very distensible. It can be like three, four liters. It can extend to three liters. And if you don't eat, it can squeeze to shrink very, that's why, if you have eating habit a lot at once and you want to lose weight, the process is you reduce the amount slowly, like reduce by the bites. And then your stomach settle down. So earlier you used to eat, let's say 100 bites. Now you eat 50 bites. All of a sudden you want to eat 100 bites. You will feel pain in your stomach because it has just stayed to that amount, okay? So from the stomach then, the chyme passes into the small intestine through the lower gastric sphincter, okay? Or we call them pyloric antrum or pyloric sphincter here. Now, 
Now let's see the histology of the stomach in detail. The epithelium of the stomach is like highly, highly modified. It is like a gland. So folding, you see, they are like velus. So if I magnify epithelium of the, let's see, and balloon it up from here, this section, and enlarge. What do you see? In the center, you have lamina propria, like here. And then from the lamina propria, there is simple columnar epithelium. The simple columnar epithelium are highly, mo most of the cells are modified and they act as glands, both ixo and endocrine glands. So their special cells have special names. Some cells are called just simple columnar epithelium. They absorb, okay? Some cells are mucus cells. They produce mucus. Mucus is a protein mucin plus water. Some cells are raft age cells that is called parietal cells. These parietal cells produce HCl, hydrochloric acid, and intrinsic factor, IF. Cheap cells and other cells in the deep that is called cheap cells. Cheap cell produce pepsin or pepsinogen. Okay. And together, these all cells are called gastric glands because they are secreting substances. So, gastric gland contains other cells too, which is not in this diagram. Gastric glands contain, cell, contain cells that secrete different product from uh, these cells and then they put into the gastric juice in the lumen. So goblet cells produce mucus, secrete mucus. Parietal cells produce HCLs, hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is essential for absorption of vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 comes only from animal product, whether it is meat or dairy. If you are restrict, very strict vegan, then you will not get vitamin B12. You have to take from outside because vitamin B12 is not made by your body. Chief cells secrete pepsinogen, which is the precursor for pepsin and pepsin is essential for protein digestion. Oh, we are the way off today. Okay, guys, I'm going to stop here because we have to start the lab. So next time we will do the rest. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.